Welcome to Building Sustainability Podcast with me, your host, Jeffrey Hart, aka Jeffrey the Natural Builder. Every fortnight, join me as I talk to designers, builders, makers, dreamers, and doers, exploring the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. Hello and welcome. This is episode 79, and it's the 29th of May. 2022. My guest today is an expert in life cycle analysis, environmental product declarations, and embodied carbon in construction. It's Jane Anderson. We are, of course, talking about life cycle analysis, also carbon sequestration, and greenwashing. Just before that, I want to say a gigantic thank you to the following building sustainability heroes. They are Roddy McIntyre, Jake Eldridge, Ollie Summerling, Hudson Architects, Roe, Andy Hales, and Alicia Morton Perkins. This incredible bunch of humans have signed up via the Building Sustainability Patreon page to support the podcast, and I couldn't be more thankful. You can join them at patreon.com forward slash building sustainability, and you can get yourself 10 hours of bonus audio as well as an opportunity to ask questions to the upcoming guests and some other bits and bobs. If you listen right to the end, then uh, I will give you a little update on the tiny house build. But just before we go into this episode, there are a few little dog yaps uh, in the first few minutes. Her little dog does settle down quite quickly and so shouldn't cause you too much audio discomfort. All right, many thanks. Back at the end. My name's Jane Anderson. I have my own consultancy called Construction LCA and I've been working on embodied carbon and the environmental impacts of construction materials, so life cycle assessment, since the 1990s. Um, so yeah, I did a master's at um, the University of East London before it moved to CAT um, and uh, that was when I first had a lecture about embodied carbon and embodied energy and thought oh gosh this is interesting nobody knows what's going on here and um yeah so I did my thesis looking at uh whether we should be knocking down housing and rebuilding it or renovating it um, in terms of kind of embodied energy although it turned out it was more to do with the performance gap and stuff like that so we didn't really come to a conclusion um and then I was lucky enough to get a job at BRE so I worked at BRE for uh just over 10 years working on the green guide and environmental profiles methodologies and uh yeah then I went into kind of serious consultancy um <laughs> and uh then I moved out of serious consultancy and started working for myself <laughs> so nice uh the 90s that's early for this kind of thinking isn't it yeah I mean there were quite a few people doing it um and it's quite interesting now there's quite a few papers that are coming out sort of the the sort of early history Mm. um but yeah kind of Norway um Sweden the UK uh the States Canada people were looking at these things and working on it in fact our government in the UK were quite active um so it was it started in the building research establishment when it was part of kind of government were looking at um, embodied energy quite seriously and then gradually sort of lots of different methodologies and then we got 15004 and a sort of common methodology and hopefully yeah starting to it's quite odd now when everybody knows what it is when you you know it's, it's, I spent 10 years telling people what I did and everyone going like oh do people do that <laughs> it's like, and now it's like oh I've heard of that yeah. So great. Right. Uh, yeah. It's quite- <laughs> you were there from the uh, the obscure first album. Yeah. Well, I'd I'd say actually second album, but yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> not, not quite the first. And then um, it seems like it it's become really important recently, embodied uh, or mm-hmm. becoming you know more of a focus. It, it seems like operational carbon was was the big thing mm-hmm. for a long time, and and it sort of uh, the balance is 
is sort of coming back now. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the the figures are all that it's it's at least ten percent of of energy and, and greenhouse gases. Um, so it is if for 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 embodied. For embodied, yeah. So it does seem yeah. a bit odd that um, kind of there hasn't really been any um, any emphasis on it in at least in the construction industry. So there have been sort of initiatives that have been trying to drive down emissions sort of industrial level with cement and steel but in terms of actually trying to to engage with with the design community and um, construction to to reduce that it it is quite recent i'm very (laughs) pleased that uh, that you're doing this um so we're going to talk about uh lcas well my first question does it matter if it's life cycle assessment or analysis not really it's the same good thing okay i think you assess and then you analyze so it doesn't really and if, okay yeah. i was i was struggling to find out whether they were two separate things and i was just not not getting it but. no i think it's the same exactly the same thing just two different words and luck, right. luckily the same acronym so yeah yeah <laughs> um great well do you want to uh, to explain what an lca is yeah uh so basically it's a way of assessing the environmental impacts uh of and a, a, a product or a system or a service, um, a city, uh, really anything, um, ideally over its whole life cycle. So it has to be said that quite often when we look at construction materials, we do focus on maybe just a part of the life cycle, sort of in, in kind of the, what we call the cradle to gate, sort of just in manufacture. Um, but it, it should really be looking at the whole life cycle and, and trying to take into account everything that that's that's influencing those impacts because lots of products let's say like insulation you has impacts to make them but then they have benefits in the use stage um and then we similarly have products like timber that have impacts at the end of life stage so kind of need to to take account of everything transport as well so yeah Uh aha and so um so they, they don't include the performance do they um you should really be looking at the use stage as well, but this is where um, kind of construction maybe kind of considers it a slightly special case. So we obviously have construction products, but really what we're trying to create is a building or a piece of infrastructure, and it's the performance of that that we're really trying to to optimise and to, to, to consider the impact um, for. So you could... You could kind of optimise individual materials as much as you like. Uh, that doesn't mean that you'll end up with buildings that are good. Um, so the actual sort of process is, is more of, um, let's say, with EPDs, environmental product declarations, we're doing the life cycle assessment for the products so that we then have the kind of the building blocks, which is not really the right word, <laughs> but, but the information to then be able to assess the whole building um, and that will include the performance of the building um, during the use stage um, and to make sure that it's it's safe mm-hmm. and uh, kind of useful and accessible and usable. Um, yeah, but, but to ideally try and reduce the impact of that building rather than just focusing on the materials. So what, what sort of things are you uh, looking at within the, the LCA? The kind of concept of life cycle assessment, you should really be looking at every any significant impact. Um, So within uh, environmental product declarations now, we look at um, about nine environmental impacts and then a whole series of what we call resource indicators. So things to do with energy, water, uh, waste, um, kind of use of recycled materials, things like that. So I think there's about, well, it's over 30 um, kind of indicators that we actually track um, for each of the different life cycle stages and modules that we're, we're measuring. So there's quite a lot. But, yeah, um, I say, unfortunately, uh, I think kind of climate change is the most pressing issue that we have at the moment. So generally, people are just focusing on on carbon. 
but uh, the LCA and the EPD gives you all the other information as well. And what what sort of um, output, I guess, are you are you getting a, a number that can be compared against other things, or is it a, a sort of written report, or how's it? What's the form it takes? So there's two different things. One is is if you if you're the manufacturer, for example, then you will get a much longer report than the EPD that you might see as a, a consumer or a, a, an architect, um, and that should um, it should give you the information that actually enables you to understand exactly what it is that's causing impact and where in your supply chain that might be coming from. Um, that's the, the, the kind of the ideal. So you should be able to not just see, oh, I've got a big impact uh, for carbon in A1 to A3. It should actually identify that that carbon is coming from electricity production or one of your raw materials. Um, so you get a much fuller report and that's uh confidential uh-huh. uh, you, i mean you can make that open if you want but very few people do uh because it will also include all the information you've given to the um to the lca practitioner um and that the verifier uses to actually check the results so um that there's potentially parts of it that you can make public that you might not want to to actually put, for example, your production data and exactly what raw materials and how much energy you're using. That might be something that that's, that you don't want to make public. Um, sure, yeah. But yeah, so that's that's your kind of project, what we call the project report. Um, but then the EPD is normally about eight, nine pages now, typically. Um, and that will have a little bit of information about the product, technical performance of the product, how it's made, um, kind of what's been assumed over the life cycle for it. So what, what's, if it provides information on transport or uh, end of life, most products now have to provide that end of life data, what's been assumed for that. Um, and then the actual results. And quite often there will be a little bit of interpretation. So it might tell you, what's causing impact but that's that's kind of optional yeah so that's what you kind of get as a consumer uh-huh. and that that number effectively or those numbers will be uh, one of the kind of key pieces of information in the EPD something called the declared unit and that's basically what everything is being measured um, for so it could be one kilogram of cement or one meter squared of plasterboard or uh, one meter cubed of insulation Um, So you have to kind of take that into account. And quite often for something like insulation, there'll be different um, declared units or functional units that are used. Actually, there's generally quite a logical reason for that. Um, So something like uh, stonewall, rockwall, basically the impact of making it is, is fairly constant per kilogram but they produce lots of different thicknesses and lots of different densities. So it makes sense for them to provide an EPD for one kilogram product. Um, The same, uh, you know, another product might really only be provided in a a typical thickness, uh, you know, provided in one hundred millimetre sheets, in which case maybe it makes sense to to do it for that. Um, Or you also see it for units of thermal resistance, um, and, and that again. So it, you have to kind of check that and quite often then you have to work back so that you can convert. If you want to start making comparisons between products, then you have to make those conversions so that you're dealing with a common unit and say for insulation that most sensibly would be thermal resistance because that's what you're presumably using your insulation mm-hmm. for. So if you select a common unit of thermal resistance, then you can then start to make those comparisons between products. Okay. So it isn't just a question of looking at the numbers and going, oh, that's bigger than that one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sadly. It's, <laughs> that, that's sort of the dream, isn't it? That, mm. you know, line all the materials up next to each other and choose the, the biggest or smallest number. Um, who, who are using LCAs and EPDs? So it does vary. Um, I suppose the, the kind of, Worst case ones are where literally somebody's got a tick box. They've been told they need to check that the product they're using has an EPD. So they just ask, has it got an EPD? And they get given one and they tick the box. And um, and that's kind of it. Um, 
And that does happen as well in, in things like LEED and BREAM, that it's about whether your product has an environmental product declaration, not about what that product declaration says. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, there's a kind of the worst product in the world can have an EPD. It doesn't having an EPD doesn't mean your product's good. It just means that you know what impact it does have. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that that's. That's sort of one end of it. I mean, people definitely are. There are some architects that are using them to actually select products and to make these these types of decisions and, uh, yeah, kind of creating these Excel spreadsheets and tables. Um, and we also see um, a lot of EPDs have been integrated into building LCA tools, so things like OneClick LCA and um, the AACB um tool that Tim Martell's designed that I can't remember the name of now, which is bad. <laughs> we, we, I'll, I'll find it and I'll put a link in the show yeah. notes. Um, uh, uh, yeah, no, I can't remember it. But yeah, so they've got lists of EPDs in them um, and they're, uh, so for example, Tim has been through and checked all the functional declared units and converted them so that when you select that product and put it into your building, um, it will automatically know uh, from from what you've told it about how thick or how much of it mm -hmm. you're using. Um, it will be able to take that information. So that takes that sort of calculation side out of it. Um, so, yeah, definitely people are using them um, there. They are being used in regulation. So, for example, in France and in Belgium, you can't make environmental claims about construction products without having an EPD that, if you like, proves your point. So if you want to say uh -huh. my product is low carbon, you actually have to have an EPD that demonstrates that it is low carbon. Um or that you could fight over, you know. Yeah. To say I, it, there's it, a it, certain it, amount of interpretation. Yeah. Is there. Yeah, there isn't a line that says this is this is high carbon, this is low carbon, but mm. you'd, you'd be able to say, here is my EPD and based on this evidence, I think I you know this claim is is fine. Um yeah and then we have um kind of people doing these these building assessments and again that happens in in kind of regulation so in the netherlands in france in germany um that not all buildings so in the netherlands it's actually all housing and and larger office buildings um have, have they've actually had to have, do lca since 2013 so right. whenever all these people say oh there's not enough data or there's no methodology or we can't do it it's like oh well they seem to have managed quite <laughs> well for nine years so so there they they have um national databases which are a combination of of kind of generic data that you use and, and epds and then you do your building lca submit it as part of uh, kind of building regulations and planning um yeah, in kind of Germany, it's all public buildings have had to do it since I think 2011. Yeah. Um, as part of, uh, they, they had to do something like uh, what's well, the German kind of BREAM called DGMB, and then the government had a version called BNB. Um, and that, um, yeah, that requires an LCA to be done, and, and you get credits based on achieving target values for that. So, uh, yeah, people have been, there's, there's a lot, that's, if you look, that's why there are lots of EPDs in France and Germany. Um, not so much the Netherlands, actually, it's interesting, but I uh, haven't quite worked out why that is. But, um, um, do you think, do you think that will be the way that uh, things go here? I would like to say that, but I suspect from what I can see from things like the industrial decarbonisation strategy and things like that, that they're looking to kind of mandate EPDs first, at least for kind of high carbon products, um, it, it sort of seems, uh, and that, that kind of regulating embodied carbon at building level is going to take a lot longer, which to me is a bit, um, I think it's kind of, doing it the wrong way around if you like because as I say it's it's about the buildings you know you can use an awful lot of a very low carbon steel or concrete inefficiently in a building and end up with a much higher carbon building than if you used a higher carbon steel more efficiently yeah I mean obviously the optimum is that you use a 
low carbon steel efficiently. But um, if you like that, the, there are lots of different parts of the, the cake to try and cut the emissions and, and reducing the impact of the products is just, let's say, one quarter of it. You've got kind of reducing the number of buildings that we build because we don't need necessarily to build all the buildings that we build. We could be reusing buildings. Um, and then you've got actually the design processes and designing more efficiently. So there's been kind of lots of work looking at structures, for example, and we tend to design all the beams in a floor based on the kind of the, the, the worst case loading rather than yeah. maybe being a little bit more um, specific. And uh, so there's the, yeah, there's lots of evidence that, that there's over specification. With good reason, you know, it'd be very dangerous if somebody accidentally put the wrong beam in the wrong place. And if they're all the same size, there's no danger of that. But um, hopefully we can overcome things like that um, or, mm. or try to work out really why the worst case beam is so bad. And maybe there's a better way of doing, avoiding one beam having such a much higher load, loading but um yeah yeah so there's lots of different ways of coming at it and just coming at it from sort of saying oh you need an epd um is I, i'm not sure I, I could imagine it would be frustrating for people to produce epds that they're not always asked for yeah that there's lots of kind of kind of questions about how that would actually work with imports and setting levels for example and and yeah, how, just having the EPD, I'm not sure whether that would really make a difference. Mm. I feel that if everybody was actually measuring the embodied carbon of their buildings, then we might kind of more quickly get more manufacturers producing EPDs and, and more buildings actually reducing an impact. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's the, that's the hope. Yes, of course. <laughs> how do you actually go about producing an EPD or an LCA? It, it <laughs> seems to me like a, a ridiculously complicated uh, thing to, to work out. It, it's kind of quite logical, really. So effectively now, I mean, it, it, it's changed, but now there are databases that effectively have information on the production of kind of everything. Right. More or less. So um, so long as you've got access to one of these databases, then that makes your life simple. If you haven't got access to those, then that, it is a much more problematic process. And when we kind of look back to sort of the 1990s when I started, you know, you'd ask a manufacturer, what are your input materials? And then you'd be going like, ah, oh, <laughs> haven't got any data for that. We'll just have to use this nasty chemical, kind of generic nasty chemical data. Uh -huh. um, but that sort of, but, but now that happens much, much less, if you like. Um, because there's just been a, a massive kind of expansion of, of data to use. Um, so effectively what you do is the manufacturer tells you, if you like, for, for one year of their production, what they produce and then everything that they used to produce it and then everything else that kind of leaves their factory, so their wastes and um, the transport information for the things that are coming and leaving their factory. Um, and all their energy data. And uh, if they're only making one thing, then that is nice and simple. And it's literally just then a question of linking all this data up to an upstream uh, kind of impact for manufacturing, say cement or sand or treated water, electricity, whatever. Um, and then effectively you have tools, uh, but you could do it in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, if you're making... 700,000 tonnes, you just divide this impact by 700,000 and then you've got the impact per tonne. Um, so that's the kind of, this very simple kind of way of doing it. Quite often factories make more than one thing. So then you've got to kind of go in and try to work out um, exactly which input materials and wastes and energy are being used for which products. Um, and sometimes that's simple because it is just mass-based. Sometimes it's not so simple and it's based on the area of production or, or it, you, you've basically got to find something that, that logically kind of fixes to, to, to that so that if they were just making one thing, you would have that impact. 
Um, but then it's mm-hmm. the same sum. And then it's just a question of kind of writing the report to explain what you've done, um, getting it verified. So basically checking that you followed the standards that are in place to make sure that you do it in a consistent way. Um, and then, yeah, publishing it. We'll be back after a quick break. Hey there, I'm Mick from the Mick and Pat Show. That's right. And I'm Pat. Looking for a podcast that's like catching up with old friends? Well, you're in luck. We're here to bring you weekly doses of lifestyle commentary, discuss culture and politics, and top it off with the occasional beer and film reviews. But it's not just about us. We're a community. Our listeners are our kin, and we let you all have a say in what we discuss. So saddle up and join the conversation at The Mick and Pat Show. You can check out our website or find us wherever you get your podcasts. Okay. And the, the verification, is that is it sort of externally verified? Um, because mm-hmm. one of the things I've heard as a sort of criticism of the, the LCAs and EPDs is that if if 10 different people d- did 10, you know, 10 different mm-hmm. reports, they'd all be slightly different. There's no sort of standard answer. Yes, probably they would be slightly different. Um, so there is potentially a difference depending on which of these, there, there are two big databases that are used for example, um, and you will get different results from those. Um, And there are assumptions that you can make as you go along. So, for example, um, so when I say there is now lots of data, there is now lots of data. But, for example, you might only have chemicals data for Germany and China. So then you've got to decide which of those two is the most appropriate because you might have got your data for or your chemical from Spain uh-huh. or, or Russia. I, I don't know. Um, so there's there's bits like that where people will make choices and assumptions and different people will make different assumptions. Um, and as a verifier, you're basically checking that those assumptions are justifiable um, and, and sensible and don't seem to have missed something but you you can't there isn't you know until we have perfect information for for everything there's always going to be that level of assumption but the verifiers basically to be a verifier um yeah you have to be external to the process so you can't work uh for the manufacturer or the lca practitioner um and um you're either in some of the systems, you're actually um, employed by the EPD program, so you're kind of completely independent. Um, in others, you are appointed by either the LCA practitioner or the manufacturer to do the verification, um, but you're acting independently um, in that process. And the verifiers basically have to be experienced LCA practitioners, so they've got to um, have demonstrated that they have you know a good knowledge of the standards and and the types of processes and products that are being assessed so uh, uh-huh. it it's a, a reasonably rigorous process um, and then um uh, these have to be repeated every every so many years don't they uh yeah they they last uh, um an epd is kind of valid for five years um it can be shorter. So for some, if it's a very new product and your production lines just started, something like that, um, it might be shorter than that. Um, or if there's, um, yeah, sometimes we see um, people that are using um, green energy certificates or an EPD from another process, then you might have a slightly shorter validity because you want to make sure that that's ongoing yeah um that those kind of commitments are ongoing um but yeah they last for five years at the end of that five-year period it is possible to say actually i i've not changed anything so i'm still doing exactly the same thing i've got the same equipment in my factory nothing has changed i want to carry on using it um and we tend to say that's fine because if you like there's a, a disadvantage in doing that because things like electricity production and and very often production of of raw materials is becoming less carbon intensive so if you carry on with the validity for kind of another five years you're probably um taking a hit uh, Mm -hmm. 
that that if you were to redo your LCA, you would get an improvement, not because you've done anything different, but just because the world has become slightly less carbon intensive, potentially. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, I mean, I was, I was thinking that uh, in a five-year gap, the chances of there being more accurate data or more relevant data to, mm-hmm. to what you're doing would be the, the big reason. Yeah, that the, the, the generally is an improvement in data. You might find that, for example, your raw materials suppliers have got an EPD that you'd be able to use that would be better than than the, the kind of generic average. But there is a, um, what's the word? It, if you were then to stop using that supplier, you would have to redo your EPD. So there is a, a kind of risk in kind of using other people's EPDs that that you you've got to um, kind of have know that that relationship is is going to be ongoing. Otherwise, it it's a bit of a a kind of um, a, a rod maybe that you've got to to keep redoing your EPD if you were to change suppliers. Sure. Yes. Got you. We talked a little bit about the stages of life. Uh, so whether mm-hmm. that's cradle to gate, uh, cradle to uh, is cradle to gate, cradle to grave or cradle to cradle are they the sort of three three options or is there is it more complicated than than that so cradle to cradle is is not really when you do an epd you you will take account of any recycling that that typically happens so when we say cradle to grave we're not actually assuming that the product is going into landfill um Potentially when all this started in the 1970s, sort of 70s, uh, that was what happened. So cradle to grave kind of made sense because that's where Coca-Cola bottles, and Coca-Cola cans went. And to be honest, it's still where 45% of Coca-Cola cans go. Um, it makes me very angry. Um, anyway, so, but, so, so we say cradle to grave, but effectively we are looking at, at recycling. So it isn't this assumption that everything is 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 waste and and not used we do um try to look at, at what's what's being recycled and, and reused um so the other stage is basically a cradle to gate is to when it leaves the factory gate cradle uh, that there's kind of cradle through construction cradle to site cradle um which which basically take transport and and the kind of construction process into account and when we talk about carbon we now talk about upfront carbon which is that kind of the the whole manufacturing through to actual construction and kind of practical completion um yeah and then we have the use stage so actually using the building refurbishing it maintaining it uh, operating it uh yeah then the end of life stage and then epds do have this this mysterious uh, what we call module D, which is basically um, so effectively what we do in LCA, you you one of the kind of core rules of LCA is that you have what's called a system boundary. So you decide what's in your system. Um, and if you want to, to do it kind of correctly, that system boundary has to be the same at both ends. So it's it's not right if you like to say that i'm going to start my system boundary for when something has been recycled and i'm going to end it before it's recycled if you if you're starting it when it has been recycled you have to go through at the end of life until it has been recycled so that you have a consistent system boundary um so we have kind of this this system boundary but what we want to show is if something has been recycled at the end of life what is the benefit of that because we can't show it as part of that end of life otherwise we would be uh we, we can't move the the boundary at the beginning so yeah so we have this module d which basically shows this this benefit um as, as if you like there's just this additional piece of information about what will happen uh normally in in a long time so this is again the difference between um Sort of the original LCAs were for things like Coca Cola bottles and cans. At that, at Coca Cola were the kind of one of the big companies that started it off. Um, but but a Coke can, you know, it it it's there no more than a year. You kind of make your Coke can out of whatever you make it out of, and then you recycle. Well, you recycle it or you put it into the to, to landfill, and and that's its its life cycle. Um, and that's so. 
sort of short that you can kind of take into account that recycling because if you are kind of using the recycled cans to make cans, then it's all kind of happening at, at a point at which the amounts that are going in and coming out are kind of balancing each other. The problem with construction is that you put whatever you're putting into your building now and what comes out of your building in 60 years time. Um, you know, when we look at what comes out of demolished buildings today, it's about a tenth of what we're putting in, um, even though it is everything that went in when those buildings were made kind of 60, 100 years ago or 30 years ago, sometimes more worryingly. Um, oh, but, 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 we, but we've just got this kind of this, this growth curve that means that, that we're always kind of catching up. So the, and the amount of recycled material, even if we recycled and reused everything, it would never meet our current demand if we continue to demand as much as, as, as we are. That, that's part of the, the reason why we have a kind of different way of looking at it in construction. Um, so we, we, we don't kind of look at this kind of closed loop altogether. We, we, we look at the system and then we show this benefit that, that's potentially going to happen in the future. But again, there's lots of reasons why, I mean, hopefully in 60 years when your building is, is kind of reused or, or, uh, kind of recycled, th the benefit of recycling is going to actually be very small because you're going to be avoiding the production of kind of zero carbon steel or zero carbon aluminium or mm -hmm. zero carbon concrete. So th these benefits that we're showing are actually maximised because they're based on today's production and we would hope that they will be much lower. So that's when you look at this module D, it's, we do say it's, it's for kind of information and, and it, it does give you a good idea of, of what happens today in terms of the benefits, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it is more informative. I mean, what I'd like to see is far more people using module D for buildings today. So actually mm. when you've got a building and you're trying to decide what to do with it, well actually assess your module C and your module D, if you were going to demolish it, what is the impact and what are the benefits and how could you improve those benefits and reduce those impacts? Um, by, by different choices yeah um, and that's what things like kind of demolition audits are about but um that's really kind of the, the where module d really is is isn't being used at the moment and and should be okay would module d be sort of encouraging people to design for deconstruction yeah so it's because yeah. my understanding is that you don't get if you use recycled materials, there's a sort of, it's, it's a good thing, but enabling the reuse of your materials mm -hmm. so far isn't, isn't yeah. so well kind of encouraged. No. And that, that would be shown in module D. So effectively, if you're um, recycling, as you say, uh, so for example, for concrete, if you're recycling the concrete, then you're, you're basically only showing the benefit of avoiding aggregate production because that's what you're generally crushing the concrete up to to use it to replace mm -hmm. um but if you were able to show that you could reuse it for example then you would be avoiding concrete production so that would be a much bigger benefit um the same with steel if you're reusing the steel you're actually avoiding the production of the steel rather than just um yeah having to have the impact of recycling it and then showing that benefit. So there is a bigger benefit if you can reuse it. Yeah. This, this is a question that came from John Butler. Well, his, his question, you know, sort of where is the incentive now for, for design for reuse and can it be encouraged more? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it, that's where it comes through is it, it would be in module D being able to show a bigger benefit in module D. Yeah. I mean, I think design for reuse is, is a clearer one. I think sometimes some of the things like designing for adaptation and flexibility, there's a danger sometimes that you put too much more kind of additional material in to try and make something flexible that, I don't know. It, I mean, it's fascinating when you look at, you know, the, the, the kind of Georgian terrace. I don't think anybody designed the Georgian terrace to be flexible and adaptable, but they are among the most flexible and adaptable buildings um and they you know they, they, it is interesting 
what it is about those buildings that makes them so um, useful and, and valued now. Um, and I'm not entirely sure that designing something to be flexible necessarily will be the will be the flexible building that you want. I mean, very often it's just where that building is and yeah, how things change. But yeah, yes, it's sort of trying to predict a future that you don't you haven't got no. any idea of you know, what the what it's going to be. So yeah, uh, sequestration of carbon. This is sort mm -hmm. of one of the big things. I was just chatting to a guy uh, who lives out in the States at the moment, and he was saying that all of the sort of big Berkeley design things are all about how much can we sequester carbon. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's too much emphasis being put on se sequestration? That's a difficult word to say, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, the, the problem is that it, it gets mis, uh, kind of misused, misunderstood. Um, so yeah, basically one of the benefits of kind of wood and, and, uh, bio-based materials is that they have stored carbon from the atmosphere within the product, um, and quite a lot of carbon. Um, and, there is a benefit. There's definitely a benefit in using that carbon. And if you like storing it in our buildings rather than using it for energy and releasing that carbon. Um, where I think there is a problem is that timber and indeed biobased resources are, are finite. And well, they're not finite, but they're, they're they're not limitless and we should be using them just as efficiently as we should be trying to use all of our resources. Um, and I think there is a danger that people start kind of stuffing their buildings with um, kind of timber or bio-based materials because the more you put in, the more carbon you are storing and then the more of this kind of negative carbon figure that you could then potentially say is offsetting any other impacts from from your building and I personally I don't think that's the way to do it uh, I think you should be using all of the materials as sparingly as you can to build the most efficient building um, and you should be trying to reduce your impact rather than just sort of stuffing it with carbon or, or bio-based carbon to offset um, yeah so that's sort of where I'm coming at it from and I think some of the, the arguments are a little bit problematic and you see these, these you do see these claims of kind of net zero, you know, oh, my building is carbon negative because it's basically got more of this sequestered carbon in it than, than the emissions. Um, and we basically try to, when we, in the, for example, the RSCS methodology, we're, we're basically saying when you measure your upfront carbon impacts, you can't take account of this sequestration um, to avoid people kind of doing this, uh, this sort of like offsetting with additional um, kind of timber. Um, so that's kind of that. And, and the issue is that at the end of life of the building to kind of, even if you keep reusing the, the, the timber which is obviously the best thing to do um effectively in a kind of carbon balance way you have to emit that carbon or pass it transfer it to the next life cycle um so you don't over the life of your building you don't get this kind of carbon negative result um and there are lots of people that, that argue that we should come up with ways of of allowing it i think to me that the best way of, of kind of actually showing the benefits. Um, Bath University have been doing work on it, showing these, um, the uh, radiative forcing and the actual impact of, but kind of over time. So it's what they now call dynamic LCA approaches. Um, but there is a big difference between um, emitting carbon today and emitting carbon in a hundred years. It, it's the same kilograms of CO2. It gives you exactly the same result in an LCA. But when you look at the radiative forcing, releasing it today will have much more impact than releasing it in 100 years' time. And the carbon that you released like 100 years ago has more 
much more impact. Is that, is that because of, of the hope of that we'll decarbonize the grid and you will have kind of that, that end of things a bit more sorted at that in the future? Um, no, it's, it's more just to do with, um, the, the fact that, that the carbon stays in the atmosphere. So whenever you release it, 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 it has more, the, the longer it's in the atmosphere, the, the more impact it, it has, if you like. Yes, understood. Um, cause it doesn't really disappear. Um, so yeah, that's the, the, the kind of problem. And they've done really that they can kind of, they show these, these curves that, that look at, at the different impacts. And I think that would almost be, it would almost be a kind of third or not a third indicator, but a, another additional indicator, another piece of additional information that would show the, the difference. Because I think we do need to start having these questions about, um, you know, should we be using biofuels, you know, somewhere like Drax that is using timber like there's no tomorrow and just burning it and saying it's carbon neutral, um, you know, th- whether there are, yeah, whether we should be having a more um, kind of informed debate about what happens to timber. Um, you know, at, at the end of life, it can go into particle board, it can be used for energy, it can be um, recycled, well, recycled into particle board and reused. And, um, you know, too much of it, I think, in my view, is being used for energy recovery. And energy recovery, it's, it's not really very, uh, you know, they don't recover a lot of energy in energy recovery. It's kind of less than 50%. Um, mm. So it's not hugely efficient. And and I think we do, I have interesting kind of conversations with my council who tell me that, um you know, they want me to put plastics into my blue bin, but soft plastics, they want to go into my black bin that will be used in our energy from waste plants. And I'm like going, well, I know you want lots of energy in your energy of waste or inputs for your energy and waste plant, but you can actually recycle this at my local supermarket, which would be a better option. But they actually need us to waste because they've got a contract to deliver waste. So I think they've got... Mm. You know, I, I think it, a lot of these things, when we're talking about recycling it, you, I think it just is fascinating whether you actually need people to carry on wasting yeah. in order to feed your desire for recycled content, for example. Um, and there's some quite interesting sort of things going on there. Mm. I mean, it, I, I rant about this quite a lot, but it seems like... Uh you know, can capitalism and, you know, this, this contract to, to feed them waste, that's, that's sort of going against what we actually need to do, but because money's, tra- you know, changing hands, that's the thing they're mm. doing. Yeah. I, I find yeah. it infinitely frustrating. Um, but, um, so I guess it sort of leads on. I, I wanted to talk a bit about greenwashing and, and sort of following on from mm-hmm. the, you know, can you have a carbon negative uh, building? A lot of people are, you know, shouting that, look at my carbon negative building. Um, and mm. it's one of the reasons I, I very much enjoy your Twitter feed is, um, is you, you calling out uh, all of Going, these claims. Rant, <laughs> rant, rant, rant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I don't, I mean, it's good that people are trying. Um but uh, yeah, it does it does annoy me sometimes when I see some of these claims and you're trying to work out have you know where I mean have they really found a product that that is clever um, or 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 are they have they just not done the sums at least according to the um, to the, the ROCS standard or or they haven't looked over the whole life cycle or. Yeah, so that the, mm. there's misunderstandings about it, but I think I mean I think it's going to become increasingly an issue. It's, it's it, it, there's some quite interesting kind of products now, but when you start getting into this sort of using CO2 from kind of emissions as an input and you're absorbing them into your product, which is sequestering them, uh, sort of the mineral kind of type products. Um, 
but you're sitting there going, well, who's actually, who's going to be able to claim that benefit? How are you going to divide it up? Because you can't, if you like, if it's the cement manufacturer who's allowing his CO2 fumes to be absorbed into your product, he's going to want to go, I don't have any CO2 emissions. Um, but the person at the other end is going to go, my product's fantastic because it's it's sucked up all his CO2 emissions. You know, they can't they can't both be claiming that, that they're, they're kind of sucking up emissions. They've got to either split yeah. it between the two of them or... Yeah, and that's going to be quite an interesting one, I think, to, to see how that works out in in kind of developing LCA methodology to, to decide who should have it and and even yeah, just just kind of politically. Um but um but yeah, it, you know, are you going to be allowed to do that if kind of if governments set emissions levels, what what are they going to allow? So the French, for example, are quite um yeah, there's lots of things they're not allowing um, in mm. terms of... Uh, Do they allow offsetting in terms of, you know, like a, an offsetting scheme? No. That's so good. Offsets, in, in terms of product labelling, no. You can talk about the fact that you have then offset, but you have to say this is the, this is the impact of my product. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't... I, luckily, I haven't had it yet, but... Um, it, it will definitely happen, I think, where we will have people and then you'll have to decide who's able to say what. I, I, it seems ridiculous that if you could, you know, I could create a, a giant cube of concrete and then spend lots of money on a, an offsetting scheme and to claim I'm you know, net zero. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it, <laughs> I, I don't see how the benefit really, well, it's not, not true accounting, is it? No. I mean, I think what is good is that everything that I'm seeing coming through at the moment is is becoming increasingly clear that, that if you want to be net zero, it's not just a question of off offsetting your emissions. You've got to have demonstrated that you've reduced your emissions um, in line with the, the kind of Paris obligations, um, which is quite hard to do. Um, and then it's only the residual emissions that you you can yeah. offset if you like um, and that will hopefully uh, bring some clarity but um, yeah it's it's mm. a little bit too easy at the moment to say lots of things and I, I think part of the problem I mean it, I know the um, the competition and markets authority are kind of having a clamp down and the advertising standards um, but I don't think they have the the knowledge and expertise to really understand some of the complexity of these things. So they, they get told, you kind of complain, and then they go, no, I think that's all right. And it's like, no, <laughs> I don't think it is. Mm. is. Is there any sort of legislation or, or sort of things happening in the future which would stop people just making mm. these, these sort of poorly accounted claims? Well, so I don't know if you've seen the draft construction product regulations that the UK are bringing in to replace. Or, or I, th I don't think they're actually to replace, but in addition. So it's basically they've come from the fire um, kind of safety side of it. But that at the moment does have a little section on um, mislead or well, claims and misleading claims, and it will be illegal to mislead people. Um, but, uh, yeah, to mislead people about anything that is, um, covered by the, any of the work requirements. So that does include kind of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it's also at the moment, it says it's misleading to emit anything that's significant, but, um, I'm not entirely sure that that is what will end up there because there's lots of questions about, what they actually, whether they mean what they say, because, and, and also then what, the, the, this is, these use words relevant and significant, I think, and you're just like, well, what, what is significant? How would you define significant? Um, does that mean everybody has to have an EPD if there is potentially some significant environmental impact from the product and, 
Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure what will come out, mm. but I think it's definitely, it seems it's on their agenda, but whether that will actually cover greenwashing, I'm, I'm not sure, but hopefully there'll be, I mean, it, they're certainly stronger on it to, through the Competition and Markets Authority. So. Yeah. Well, I'm conscious that we're uh, we're at an hour, um, but I did just want to say um, one of the things I really enjoyed, again, on your Twitter feed was uh, uh, the city bench. I don't oh, know yeah. If you... <laughs> so they, it was a bench which has some vertical moss panels, and mm. they claimed that the bench will absorb 240 metric tonnes of CO2 per year. Mm. I, think there was, I think there was an error somewhere in their calculations. Because I wouldn't want to sit anywhere near that bench. Yeah, <laughs> really. I mean, what would that actually kind of physically mean? Well, I mean, wood is wood is about four five hundred kilograms per meter cubed, so two hundred and forty metric tons is uh, four hundred and eighty meters cubed. So, yeah, there was definitely something wrong somewhere in the calculations but uh yeah you'd have to be going along kind of cutting the moss yes it was yeah I don't, it's a mystery i mean i think they're great and i'm sure they do improve air quality but i'm not entirely convinced that they're sequestering that much carbon and even if they are what are they doing with it so it's it's like mm. i mean it grows and it grows and it, it you know and if they then came and trimmed it and then they took it away. What what would be happening with it? I imagine it would just be going back into the atmosphere again. So yeah, it, it, yeah, it's good. I I recommend everyone uh, follow you on Twitter so you get the 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 updates on uh, on you know calling out inaccuracies and uh, well, just fraudulent claims. Yes, yeah. yeah, but I do. I mean, that's the thing. People need to call people out on these things. I think. You know, just ask the question, how did you measure it? Really? Yeah. And I think it comes from a place of, you know, the, the people publishing that. They, they'd really like mm. it to be true. Mm. They, yeah. there's, there's this desire to, to sort of save the world, I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But through sort of miracle cures, maybe, rather than... Yeah, and I, I mean, I like this idea of, of not, instead of having kind of grey concrete, nice, mossy, green buildings, but... Um, I do have I have a, a a feed somewhere that's that's dead living walls. Oh yeah. We had a we had a dead living wall at BRE, and it's not they're not very pretty, and they they, they I mean hopefully they're getting better. But so uh, yeah, sort of if your pump isn't maintained or something gets blocked or dead and quite ugly. Many thanks to Jane for sharing her knowledge and time with us. Uh, I particularly enjoyed some of the little side rants. There is a link to Jane's Twitter, which I clearly love, and to her website and some other bits and bobs in the show notes. Be sure to check those out. Um, I'm pretty sure the LCA tool she mentioned, uh, but couldn't remember the name of, is PH Ribbon um, alongside One Click LCA. Again, links in the show notes. I want to say a big thank you as well to Mr. John Butler uh, for supplying some question inspiration. Uh, be sure to check out episodes 63 and 64 to hear John himself speaking. Again, I'll stick some links in the show notes. And then a little tiny house update. So uh, some of my family came to visit last weekend. And so instead of having a moving in celebration we had a moving the tools out celebration. I have been living in the building site that is my house since the 1st of January. And oh my goodness, it feels great to have the, the space just be full of things that I want around me uh, for my general living. Um, if I feel so much more settled. And of course, in true self-build fashion, uh, I now have zero enthusiasm to finish the last little bit. Um, with any luck, then I should have my solar power sorted this week. I feel like I've said that before. Um, I'm ever hopeful. 
uh, electricians are hard to come by at the moment. Um, but always ending on big good news. Uh, I've installed my bird feeder and right now there's a woodpecker just uh, chomping away on the peanuts. So life's pretty good. Okay, big love to you all. Until next time, bye-bye.